welcome to the Jill on Money podcast. It is Friday, October 30th. And as expected, we got a just ginormous GDP report. The economy expanded at a 33.1% annualized pace. So that really calculates to a 7.4% quarterly increase. Now, you know how the math works, gang. We had a 5% contraction in the first quarter. Again, these are annualized numbers. Then a 31.4% contraction in the second quarter. Now we get this big 33% up. And you know what that means? The economy is still 3.5% smaller than it was at the end of last year. So that tells you we still got a ways to go. You know, that's a big number. All right. Other things that are noticeable, companies spent money, people spent money, personal savings rate as a percentage of disposable income down, down by a lot. It was down to 15.8% in the third quarter, off from 25.7% in the previous quarter. And what that tells me is essentially as the government assistance, whether it was a stimulus check, extra unemployment benefits, whatever, as that started to dry up at the end of July, what happened? People had less money to save. That's very difficult to calculate in terms of like going forward and how this man- how this will impact the economy. I think it's not great news for people who are out of work. They did probably try to beef up their emergency reserve like they should, but until we get another stimulus, and I hope we do at some point, that is pretty much about as good as it's going to get in terms of the savings rate. And I think that's going to keep dwindling down. All right. Well, that's a GDP report and that's enough for today on that. Um, We will uh, be happy to talk to you more about any economic indicators. Uh, This is the last big report before the election, but it's also backward looking, right? I mean, this is the third quarter that we're talking about. Third quarter's over. We're in the fourth quarter. And I think that fourth quarter growth is not going to be nearly as strong for a very simple reason. As reported virus cases surge, there are going to be some more shutdowns. Maybe they're more limited. Maybe it's just going to be county by county. It might be city by city, but it's going to be an issue for the economy. And that's really yet another reason why it's all the more important that Congress gets to work after this election and gets a deal done. Okay, enough of that. Let's go on to your questions. This is from Linda, who says, reading your column today about college aid amid a pandemic, it triggered possibly related questions. My 39-year-old son's girlfriend is 35. She just revealed she's got $50,000 in student loans from a now defunct organization in California. One, is there any relief out there for students who were scammed with false promises and who took out loans for education at now defunct for-profit schools? Yes, there is. Mark's going to send you the link. You you make a claim through studentaid.gov, but there's been huge holdups and uh, been a lot of problems in in getting this done. So I just want to lay that out before you even try to do this or she tries to do this. It's going to be tough. The larger question, what advice would I give to someone like her who's got a two-year community college degree and a BA from a defunct for-profit school? This is because her company took her out of her marketing department, put her in data entry. She's miserable. They also cut out education assistance for employees. I mean, look, I think what she has to do is start getting busy and you know use the, fi- the fact that she actually has a paycheck, thank God. And use this time to really think about what she wants to do next. Linda writes, from my now long ago experience with career counselors, I'm aware of a wide range of skills, expertise, connections to companies, hiring, especially in the COVID age. I don't know. I don't know about the whole career counseling thing. I I feel like she might do uh, herself uh, much, much more good by popping onto LinkedIn, using every connection she knows, and trying to leverage her own network or expand her own network. And I think that, listen, you got to be pretty realistic. It's the middle of a pandemic. There's 10 million people out of work. So, you know, this may not be the very best time for her to jump ship. Let's do this first, which is essentially 
make the claim to see if she can get relief from this scam product called a degree from a for-profit institution. Okay, this is from Nicole. Hi, Jill and Mark. I'm writing on behalf of my husband who pre-COVID had three sources of income as a musician. One is a part-time desk job at a music agency. Second, managing a music school. Third, and most substantial piece was performing at weddings, corporate events, etc. He was able to collect the regular unemployment insurance for the music agency job. He did so since March. However, that's now about to stop. He's got a modest part-time income still coming from music school, but it's the only thing coming in. In a nutshell, he went from three to one in terms of income streams. He's under the impression that since the state of Massachusetts money for the music school piece of the pie is coming to an end, then that is that and we'll need to tap our emergency fund. However, I'm under the impression he might collect up to 46 weeks of pandemic unemployment assistance, assuming he goes back into the system and applies for fresh PUA. Yes, 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 yes. He has to go and apply for this. He must apply for this because that is exactly what it's for. It is for people who are self-employed or gig workers like your husband. So what you need to do is make sure that he files that claim right now. Whenever there's any doubt, the worst that can happen is they say no, but yes, apply. Okay. Uh, Sylvia is considering purchasing a hybrid long-term care policy. I'm 73 years old. I'd invest $10,000 a year for 10 years. The death benefit would be $133,861 would remain that. At age 75, I could access $108,000 for long-term care. At age 85, I could access 120000 I have no other long-term care insurance. I'm in good health now. Is this a wise investment? Thanks, Jill. Hey, I don't know. And I'll tell you why. What's your asset base? How much money do you have? Without that piece of information, we cannot make a decision or help you make a decision. Because if you don't have a ton of money, and this is all the liquidity you have, and you're throwing it into this policy, then no. But if you've got a million and a half bucks and you know, you're, you've got ample reserves and this is a good use of your money, maybe, but I need more information. So follow up with me. Tell me a little bit more about what you have. Uh, question. Uh, this is from Gary. I've got a year left to work. Should I take money out of my deferred comp plan to pay off my house? No, you should not. Isn't that easy? I love word, one word responses. Mark's peppering me with these. Hold on. Lindy, if I use my pension for a down payment on a house, will I have to pay taxes on what I withdraw? Yes, you will. Don't do that. (laughs) Anna uh, says, I've heard one of your listeners say you don't favor 403B. Can I ask why? I don't not favor a 403B. It's just that some 403B plans have lousy investment choices. Okay. So don't worry. I like 403Bs. It's just that I don't like annuities that are inside 403Bs and often they are. So let me know what your choices are. Joe says he just started a new job after seven month job search. Way to go, Joe. All right. I've been fortunate that I had emergency funds to weather the storm. Fortunate to find a job, but the new 401k plan is with a large insurance company with high fees. Ugh. One to two percent. Limited fund choices, no matching. My thought is to max out my Roth IRA with Fidelity index funds and max out an HSA with any additional savings, do a Roth conversion. Want to get yours and Mark's thoughts. Thank you, Joe. Mark, I love this plan. What about you? There's no match. You're not giving anything up. So yeah, I, I say go for the Roth, max out the HSA, do that Roth conversion. And yeah, there's no reason to put your money in a crappy plan if you don't have to. So I say go for it. Well done. Soon to be well done. All right. This is from Amina who writes, good afternoon. I truly appreciate your podcast. I will have a personal question of my own in the near future, but I wanted to ask about Forex trading. I heard you answer a question on one of your episodes that I Am Academy was a scam. It was after my boyfriend had already purchased the program for a couple of months. I wanted to ask you if you heard anything about Adam Koo and his Piranha Profits company. I'll put the link below. We don't want to get scammed again. Thank you very much. If you don't want to get scammed again, my suggestion is to stop clicking on things and trying to do Forex trading. Stop the insanity. Don't do this. And I don't even care what the system is. Why are you doing foreign exchange trading? I I don't understand it. 
it, it, it's really, it's maddening, actually, more to the point. Oh, gosh. I don't want to end on a downer. Come on, guys. Hey, um, this weekend we got a great interview with a wonderful, wonderful colleague, Sharon Epperson. She works at CNBC. Gosh, I just I just think she's fantastic. And she's going to be our guest this weekend. So you can settle in. You can have a nice Halloween um, change your clocks kind of moment and get zenned out with us and just listen to a really interesting conversation between two chicks who cover personal finance. Okay. If you have a question, send us an email. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Don't forget, wash your hands, wear your masks, maintain your physical distancing, and put your hands metaphorically on someone's back. It will make you feel a lot better. All right, we'll talk to you tomorrow.